All right, everyone, Mark Collette and a few others were talking about this and saying basically, oh, why is the free speech crowd not talking about this issue? Well, I'll, I'll take up your challenge. I'll talk about it and I'll give you the same, the same rational explanation as a minarchist that I give for Tommy Robinson. Uh, as a result of what you're posting. By the way, I'm not even fully comfortable <laughs> with private entities if, if they're monolithic making such decisions either. I think it should be like a public utility. It's time to stop! Hey, so tell me if you've heard this one before. While I agree that this house is on fire, we can't put out the house fire entirely because if we do, then there would be a chance it could burn down. No, you haven't heard this before because it's completely fucking asinine and makes no sense whatsoever. Well, that's effectively the minarchist argument for the state. Many recognize that the state is an inherent evil. They recognize that everything it does results in complete disaster, and it destroys every non-government style of organization it attempts to involve itself in. And they even recognize that a state is not required for infrastructure to exist. So naturally, you'd think that these people would conclude that the state is an enemy to society and needs to be abolished, right? Well, no, and a large part of this problem is sort of touched upon when you look at what minarchists actually believe. Minarchism as an ideology proposes that you can limit government authority within a confined space to where you can establish an ethical and libertarian society. This position, however, is inherently impossible even from their own ideological standpoint, since the government inherently requires theft in order to fund its services, and the premise of a government, what it does on a basic level, is insert itself in the market and monopolize it. Therefore, even if everything in this hypothetical minarchist society was unrealistically ideal, there were no deep state interest groups manipulating the political landscape, everyone had a 140 plus IQ and was incredibly well educated, everyone actually cared about minarchist politics and trying to keep the government confined, you inherently would still not be able to do this because the government fundamentally is unethical and functions as a parasite on society. I mean, you don't even need to go as far as examining how the government functions to find problems. What the government is, is simply a monopoly on arbitration. That's it. It's an organization which uses violence to stop all other entities unwilling to conform to its policies on how arbitration should be done. That is the only reason that a so-called rule of law exists. No justifiable explanation, just the government declaring non-violent actions to be crimes and making exceptions for itself over actions that would be crimes if committed by a citizen. Literally nothing more than someone stating their opinion and threatening you if you try and live your life any way which deviates away from their opinion of how you should. So it's glaringly apparent that minarchism is a logically impossible position to take that stems from cognitive dissonance. People who've realized the inherent unjustifiable nature of the state but can't wrap their minds around the idea of not having it. Similar, I suppose, to an animal which has lived its entire life in a cage being offered freedom and refusing to leave the cage because the idea of not being domesticated is too radically different from how it's lived its entire life. I don't really like saying things like that, because I prefer to discuss ideas and I find things like that are not very helpful. However, the incredible gymnastics that minarchists can do from taking the libertarian talking points of how free association is best and how the government is coercive, or how the government claims to have rights that citizens don't, then when challenging the state itself for the same reason, they do a complete 180 and make the same 
same illogical arguments they're vocally opposed to. Because of this, I have no choice but to conclude that minarchism is a result of cognitive dissonance. And I think that this could be no better illustrated than by Jan Helfeld, a libertarian commentator who's somehow managed to schedule debates with politicians like Bernie Sanders, Harry Reid, or Nancy Pelosi, and just absolutely wiped the floor with these people. What was the, my question? I answered your question. My question was whether the individuals ever had the right to initiate physical force against other citizens that have not initiated or threatened to well, initiate seem, physical force. You seem to Do think... Do you think they did or they didn't? I think your you question... You have an answer, either sir, yes or no. Frankly, I think your question is absurd. Well, your, your fine. Basic, your basic, the viewers would like to know what you think about I'm it. I'm giving you the answer for the fourth time. The basic premise of your question is that all acts of government Every law that is being passed somehow implies physical force against innocent people. No, no, I we haven't live. said that. I, I have not said that. That has nothing to do with the question that I asked. All I've asked you is whether the individual citizens ever had the right to initiate physical force against other citizens that have not initiated or threatened to initiate physical force. I've answered your question five times. Frankly, well, is it a it's, yes or no? It's an absurd yeah, I'd seriously recommend looking up that debate, because Bernie got fucked so hard, I'm surprised that YouTube didn't take it down for violating their terms of service. Well, he is a minarchist, and he debated against Larkin Rose as well. That will be located in the description, because it's over an hour long. Anyway... Larkin Rose inquired Jan over his first point to disproving the possibility that a political authority could ever exist, that being that it's impossible for any group to delegate rights to itself which other entities don't have, i.e., it's impossible for the state to justify coercing people when if a regular person were to do the same thing, they would be considered and treated as criminals. Instead of conceding the it's fear-mongering about how if there aren't any borders or there aren't any military... And one night, when you're all sleeping in your room, the gingers are gonna get you. They're gonna get you! And the minarchist, Sticks Hexenhammer, made pretty much the same argument in a video he made against anarchism, which Shane Killian has an excellent rebuttal to. Here, horsey, want a carrot? Here, here, buddy. So now that we've already established the fact that it's impossible to have a libertarian society with a state, some may concede that they aren't libertarian, but that a so-called limited government is still a desirable end goal to try and achieve. Unfortunately, that's not possible either. Firstly, as I may have lightly touched upon earlier, to even try and create a so-called night watchman state, you need a large majority of the population to ideologically support minarchism. Because once you've accepted that the state can coerce people and fundamentally does have a different standard which they own up to, which is their own standard and whatever they arbitrarily decide, the government will constantly fight against its citizens to try and take more from them and perpetually expand itself, since politicians have a direct profit incentive tied to making the government more expansive. You can't even argue against their unethical behavior since they've monopolized the courts and because you'd be internally inconsistent with your own reasoning in doing so. You accept some coercion to create government-funded commodities and establish the state, what's stopping the government from coercing people to fund different commodities which you don't like. Because you don't like it, either all coercion and double standards are unacceptable or none are unacceptable. You cannot have it both ways. It's just politically not possible to try and keep a limited night watchman state. The United States, for example, was an attempt to create a minarchist society and within a single presidency, you had George Washington imposing higher tax rate than King George did on the colonies, an army which had just fought in the revolution being used to put down revolutionaries who say George Washington was an emerging tyrant, and the government constantly trying to expand itself and create new services to justify raising tax rates. The United States history is proof that a night watchman state is not sustainable. But it failed in history, we could just try it again, right? 
well, even if everything went swimmingly, even if it was so impractically perfect that no one would even bother testing this hypothetical scenario because it could never happen in reality, you still would not be able to sustain a minarchist society. This is because whether the population is expanding, the government is trying to expand its reach with the few programs it would have, which, by the way, is what gives it incentive to increase its size, or simply demand for services that the government has monopolized goes up that it doesn't let private competitors enter the market in. The government will have to increase taxes in order to sustain itself. This also gives the government the incentive to restrict trade, since competition creates cheaper alternatives which are more efficient than government-provided services. The government will do this until the tax rate is so high that there is no incentive to actually trade in the private sector, since people will be making so little. More likely than not, they'll trade in the gray and black markets to avoid the government's taxes or restrictions on trade. Meaning that the state will either step in and establish a centrally planned model, or will try and create state-run corporations to stimulate revenue, which in most countries in the West we're already seeing early stages of this process particularly in European Union countries, but also in the United States with heavy nationalization and corporatist regulations creating anti-competitive markets. Essentially, the end conclusion of any government will be a sort of Stalinist dystopia due to economic necessity. And the problem with this is that if the former, you have no supply and demand curves, meaning it's not possible to properly allocate commodities because you have no way of cost-effectively managing your resources. If the latter, the government would only be encouraging more people to trade in gray and black markets, since everything is becoming so expensive that it'll eventually no longer be profitable to trade over the table. So why not just have anarchy at that point? No matter what, the end result of any form of statism is the infinite and perpetual expansion of the state, and the end result of that is the collapse of society. Now look, I understand minarchists have their hearts in the right place, but how far you have to stretch in order to defend the state, which itself is a violation of the principles you claim to acknowledge, it's just so clear that there's no possible defense for the state and political authority and minarchy is nothing more than an appeal to the balance fallacy. The idea that somehow if you achieve a middle ground between two extremes, you'll achieve a desired end. And as shown, this is not possible. Not only for a libertarian society, but for any society. The state is nothing but a vile, disgusting parasite which only has interest in perpetuating itself at the expense of society, even to the point of running it into the ground entirely. In conclusion, what's the difference between minarchism and anarchism? About six months.